Hi, I'm Harris Bomberguy and welcome to Serious Law Analysis. Oh god. It's, it's, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. Today we're looking at the truly radical Sonic the Hedgehog. I remember commercials with people chanting Sonic's name in urban environments like he was a revolutionary coming to rescue them from their plight. So I grew up assuming Sonic was some kind of deep social commentary about fighting a revolution against the desolate urban terror of Americana. And after finally playing them, I can tell you that those commercials were spot on. Sonic's really dark and serious if you stop to think about it for like 12 seconds. I mean, let's begin with the name. He's Sonic THE Hedgehog. Why THE? Because he's the last one. What happened to all the other hedgehogs? Well, maybe the genocide doomsday robots have something to do with it. The world of Sonic is threatened by the evil Dr. Robotnik. But that's in the inferior Western dub for the Gaijins out there. In the original Japanese version I got an import, his name is far more thematically relevant. He's called Dr. Eggman. Because, well, he looks a bit like an egg, doesn't he? <laughs> Robot Negman has almost completely taken over the world of the story with his machines, leaving very few free animals remaining and doubtlessly killing many others. Sonic is THE Hedgehog because he's the last one. Sonic has decided to identify with this status, making it his literal title. It is a message of peace and justice to the free animals that remain, hiding in the cracks of the world. As long as any of them are left, even one, there is still hope. But to his enemies, it is a reminder of what they have done, the things they have taken, and of the sins that will be repaid. For the forces of darkness, the last hedgehog is like an emissary from hell, an angel of vengeance. The level progression functions to represent the transition from the idyllic prelapsarian world to the man-made dystopia of Robotnik. You slowly go from lush greens, rolling fields so free they have naturally occurring loop-de-loops, all the way to the Starlight Zone, a massive industrial superhighway for Robotnik's new world where the loop-de-loops -loops are mechanistic and devoid of soul. The game designers reuse the loops just enough that by the time you get to the areas taken over by Robotnik, they feel like a silly gimmick. The Mona Lisa used to be a unique, beautiful spectacle that many would come to see for miles around hanging in whatever museum it's in. But now you can Google it or get it on a postcard and the image has become replicated so endlessly that it's meaningless. Thus, also, to loop-de-loops. In mass-producing the loopies, Robotnik has thereby ruined them and reduced their spectacle. It sends a strong message that his world is technologically advanced, but feels fake and uncanny. A copy of something beautiful, reused so much that its value is lost. Or you could say it just represents how Sega were running out of ideas, which is a pretty accurate reading probably, but in the words of Roland Barthes, Fuck off, just fuck off, alright? It works as a metaphor, and you can't stop me! At the end of each level, instead of taking over the castle of an inferior king and raising the flag of his personal favourite in the style of a certain authoritarian monarchist war criminal, Sonic simply graffitis over a sign with Robotnik's face on it in an act of pure symbolic protest. This is important characterization for Sonic. Sonic's devil-may-care attitude is a method of dealing with the utmost depression he feels fighting a near-impossible battle as he copes with the loss of his race. Imagine having to get up every morning and fight a one-man revolution knowing that you'll never have a hedgehog wife to hug, 2.5 hedgehog children to watch get on the bus to school, or a white picket fence and fluffy hedgehog dog. Hedgehog. All those moments will be lost in time, like my train of thought once I thought of the pun hedgehog. What a terrifying fate to have to live with every day. That's why Sonic goes into the fetal position every time he attacks. Every moment of his battle is an attempt to stave off his existential angst. Beneath that happy smiley and waggy finger lies a hearty serving of depressive personality disorders. More like Sonic the Herzog, am I right? <laughs> Death is certain. After crossing the highways and miraculously not getting run over like most actual hedgehogs I've seen on the motorway, Sonic enters the Scrap Brain Zone. One giant literal machine, a nightmare of steam and steel. 
The Scrap Brain Zone is Eggman's vision for the future, a world of grim uniformity and pure order, everything in its rightful place but devoid of life or a soul. This zone features numerous allusions to the Charlie Chaplin film Modern Times, specifically the sequence where Chaplin's character falls onto the conveyor belt he works on and into the machine within. It spits him out as a bizarre, monstrous version of his former self, his mind warped by the experience. This was a metaphor for the effects of capitalism's work environments on its workers. It literally altered them, made them more like machines themselves. Chaplin would revisit this idea in The Great Dictator, in which the Nazi ideology metaphorically turned people into machines, with machine minds and machine hearts, but not machine penises because robots don't need to have sex, the poor bastards. There! I've just taught you everything you need to know about film interpretation. Now you can share my degree, and my UNPAYABLE AMOUNTS OF DEBT! As a true successor to Chaplin, Sonic is fighting a battle against the evil robots in order to free the good people trapped within them. Inside the heart of your enemy is a good person who has lost their way. But you can't make a freedom omelette without breaking a few Robotniks. Robotnik leads Sonic into a trap, and then violates the Geneva Convention by attempting to kill a prisoner of war. Oh no. Sonic falls into the garbage dump, a reappropriated piece of the labyrinth that runs throughout the planet, covered in sewage, and the water's tinted purple by the pollution spewing from the machines above. Luckily, Robotnik left a spring here that leads directly into his office. I'm not sure what this is a metaphor for, and the Sonic wiki is too busy figuring out Robotnik's canon height and weight to figure out the implications of the spring that causes Sonic not to die in an otherwise inescapable sewer. But don't worry, we've carefully chronicled that he's 282 pounds and his skin is beige. Yes, that is a word that we use to describe colours of skin. Yeah, yeah. Robotnik's dead. Okay, look, I was told this game was for children, right? But I just helped the last of an extinct race gank a dictator by sabotaging his flying hover chair thing and watching as he crashes and burns and dies in the immolating flames of vengeance. What kind of child is supposed to play this? Officially an actual, literal murderer, Sonic returns home to a hero's welcome and leaps towards the screen, thanking the player directly for their help, making you complicit in an act of terror. With Eggman dead, all that's left of civilization is a bunch of tiny animals who'll probably need years of therapy to undo the horrors of being trapped in a machine and forced to watch it destroy their entire family. But if you got all the Chaos Emeralds, there's a couple more flowers. Aw, that's nice. Sonic the Hedgehog is a surprisingly morally complex story about the importance of extrajudicial murder, and there's some deeply resonant themes going on in there about man's battle with the machine. You can't really rate uh, depth on any kind of scale because it's a kind of nebulous concept to begin with, but if you could, I would give Sonic the Hedgehog a 7.5 out of 10 on the depth scale that I just made up. It asks a vital question of our society. Is it right to unleash bloody war and death against authoritarianism? And it answers, yes, definitely. Fucking kill those guys. You can say that Blair and Bush's invasion of Iraq had a needlessly high civilian death toll and ignored the will of the international community and they deserve to be locked up. And you'd be right, but you can't say they aren't 90s kids at heart. By which I mean, if they had a single heart between them, they probably stole it from a child. If you have a suggestion for the next game you want me to do a deep lore analysis of, please let me know in the comments, and I'll look for the one that's the one I already wanted to do and pretend you picked it. See you around! Yo, he goes slow. He ain't no fool with that sonic speed. He just always cool. Sonic, sonic the hedgehog. No fool. Come on, just show me what you got. Going fast is cool. Going slow is not. Sonic, sonic the hedgehog. No fool. Wild game, dude. Setting danger zone. You and Sonic speed through, or you are dead. Not Sonic the Hedgehog, the hot new game from Genesis Games. Systems and games go separately. No fool. Oh, hey, uh, thanks for watching. 
Uh, this week I'd like to thank Aaron Solzbrun, Alex Lemkovich, Alexander Corbett, Alicia Parker Martell, Amy B, Ben Adamson, Bill Mock, Bob, Brennan Arzt, Casey Schneibel, Kieran, Claw Sue, Corwin Light Williams, Damian Edney, David Rose, Derek Pranger, Ed Costigan, Eric Hunter, Femin Ninja, Graf and Blackpaw, Hero Reward, Jack Ryan, Joanne York, John Cantwell, Joseph Greco, Lady Naga, Layden Pierce, Luke Gould, Malarkey Bingo, Marco Shard, uh oh, Mr. Xenophobe, Neverminder, Olivia Mello, Renslayer, Robert Phillips, Samael, Scartharax, Lord of the Roaches, Scott Gerton, Sean Higgins, Siegfried Pinzer, Spilt Coffee, Stefan Lindberg, Thad Wazalewski, Thomas Johansson, Two Armed Blues and Red Drapes, Zachariah Taylor, I Am Turnip, and Rick Hemi. Thanks so much, and... Fucking eyes are killing me.